We now come to the cold beating heart of generative linguistics and the domain of syntax. If semantics was concerned with certain logical aspects of meaning, syntax tries to do without meaning altogether and to view sentences as sequences of words which accord with combinatorial rules of a given system called a language. Sequences of words exhibit an awful lot of structure. There are rules about what can go where. John kicked the ball is a fine sentence. The ball kicked John is a fine sentence. That ball John kicked is not a sentence. Kick John the ball is not a sentence. So there seems to be some kind of rules underlying this. And the notion that syntax and semantics are distinct is illustrated by this famous phrase cooked up by Noam Chomsky, Colourless green ideas sleep furiously. This phrase, he claimed, was a grammatical sentence in the English language and also meaningless. Now you can make of that what you will. I find the claim that this is meaningless to be an affront to common sense, to be honest with you. Having read a lot of poetry, I can guarantee you that meaning doesn't lie on the surface and that when I read this, it encourages me to develop ideas, to think about furiously sleeping ideas is productive in me. So I'm going to disagree with Chomsky about meaning on this, but that gives you a sense of the view taken by syntax. Now, each of those words, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, belongs to a specific class of words, which we call the parts of speech. So we've got two adjectives and a noun and a verb and an adverb. And they form a, a structure together. So sleep furiously belongs together, creating what's called a verb phrase. The adjective and noun green ideas belong together to form a single noun phrase. And it's nested recursively inside the larger noun phrase colorless green ideas. You can see recursion already at the phrasal level here. And the top note of that phrase structure, tree, is the S for sentence. The notion of a grammar in syntactic theory is precisely those sets of regularities that determine which sequences of words are uh, acceptable within a language, which belong to the language, and which do not belong to the language. So this is slightly different, perhaps, from the sense of grammar that you learned as a set of rules that you ought to follow. Um, the kind of rules that we're talking about in a domain like syntax um, need to be understood properly because we've all learned grammar in school from books and we were told do things one way or don't do things another way. Syntacticians, in common with linguists generally, like to see themselves as scientists, not as teachers. Um, so when we say that there's rules or laws or so on, we're speaking, we're not talking about the arbitrary conventions of politicians, for example. And it's not the linguist's role to tell anybody how to speak. Linguists object to being called grammar Nazis. Um, and we need to distinguish then clearly between a prescriptive approach, which is appropriate for a textbook that teaches you how to speak a language, lays down the law, and a descriptive approach that approaches language as a phenomenon of the natural world that needs to be described. In the descriptive approach, we observe language and try to figure out what it is that people are doing. So linguistics sees itself very clearly as a de descriptive enterprise and not a prescriptive enterprise. But that's a myth linguists like to tell themselves. It's greatly oversimplified. The kind of system that is at stake here, that is assumed to have boundaries such that we can say that this sequence of words belongs to it and that sequence of words doesn't belong to it, that kind of system can only be in place if there are very many normative prescriptive practices in place. If there are teachers telling children what to do, if there are dictionaries defining words, spelling tests, standards of in public media in the BBC and in writing. Only if those normative elements are in place is it possible to even identify such a system. And those normative practices exist only in um, complex human organized societies and so they're only possible since the advent of agriculture and indeed the advent of writing in uh, ancient Mesopotamia or writing is actually originally originated three times 
in Latin America, in China, and in Mesopotamia. But in each case, even the identification of a system is only possible after all these are possible. And this is part of my argument that language understood in this sense is something that is very, very recent. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, the phrase structure tree that we just saw for the sentence colorless all oh, colorless green ideas sleep furiously is an example that would have been in place in the early days of transformational grammar. That enterprise changed then as it moved on to trying to identify what are the principles that make up any language and which are assumed to be known or available to a child at the outset. And what are the parameters that distinguish one language from another, which is assumed to be the cues that a child is learning as they become competent speakers of one language rather than another. So an example of this is the idea that a principle would be that every language can express simple statements of uh, fact that have the following form, John kicked the ball. In that sentence, the subject is John. Kicked the ball is a verb phrase containing a verb kicked, and the ball is the object. Every language seems to be capable of such sentences, but the order of the terms in that, the subject, verb, and object, differs across languages. So in English, that order is subject, verb, object, SVO. If we were to take, a, for example, Irish, we would find a different canonical word order. In Irish, the order is verb first, then subject, then object. It may or on, I ate the bread, or eat the bread, is verb first, then subject, then object. It might be interesting to note that the rather peculiar way that Master Yoda speaks in Star Wars uh, seems to mess with the canonical word structure of English. Lost a planet, Master Obi-Wan has. That has the verb first, or a verb phrase. Um, oh no, I've got that wrong. That Yoda's not entirely consistent, and nor am I here, but he messes with this canonical word order, which is why Yoda sounds kind of weird. The further development of the generative syntax school led then to the faculty of language narrowly considered in which the property that was at stake was the presence of recursion. We just saw a noun phrase within a noun phrase, and we've seen sentences within sentences. And so we won't pursue that any further. We'll just let that syntax sit there. And we're going to move now very briefly to um, the next domain down, which is called morphology. And it's really morphology is not separate from syntax. As English speakers, we like to think of our sentences as being made up of words. And we identify those words on the written page by the presence of spaces, which is a rather recent habit, actually. Not all languages have words in this sense, and certainly not all mark them by spaces in this sense. Morphology is the general discipline concerned with the combination of the smallest meaningful units. And the smallest meaningful unit is not a word, but a morpheme. So take the English word dog, for example. You can split it into its constituent sounds, but those sounds have themselves no meaning. So dog is a single morpheme and a single word. But dogs splits into two meaningful units dog and plural marker. Doubtful splits into two meaningful units, doubt and full. Now full only occurs in combination with some kind of stem like fruitful or wonderful or doubtful. Um, but it's, a, it's meaningful precisely because it functions in that way. And a slightly odd case is given by cranberry, where the berry piece is clearly a morpheme because we find it in blueberry and blackberry and raspberry and strawberry. Uh, the cran is only found in this combination, but precisely because it occupies that slot that distinguishes one kind of berry from another, we can say it is also meaningful. It's called a bound morpheme. Now, we don't have to go far to find different approaches to word generation. In German, for example, word production is much more creative than it is in English. And very often, that which we say in a single phrase in English with distinguished words with spaces in between them is expressed in German by the novel composition of a word. 
So I made up this word Straßenbahn Ritzenreinemacher Frau, which is the woman who cleans the gaps in the tram lines. Uh, perfectly expressible in English, but you need a phrase for it, whereas in German you make a word for it. Chinese is another language where we don't find the kinds of words we, as we have in English. Originally Chinese was monomorphemic, so one morpheme playing the role of one word. More recently, the morphemes have become agglutinated to form combinations, uh, typically in, in, in pairs. Um, but if you read Chinese, of course, there's no spaces illustrating clear words in the same way that there are in, in English. So morphology is concerned with these processes of word formation and how the smallest meaningful units get to be combined. In this extent, it is continuous with syntax. Uh, psycholinguists are very, very interested in this. So we, if we compare the language of English with German, we noted that in English, words are more or less fixed. They're kind of fossils. And in German, we have greater potential to create new words on the fly as the situation demands. So one might ask, well, do speakers of these languages store, do they know the combinations or do they know the parts out of which it's made? Um, do they store related um, meanings or do they construct those on the fly? Those kind of discussions go on in psycholinguistics. And we'll wrap up this rather dry section on morphology with something which is going to be a little bit rude. So if you're of a sensitive nature, you can finish watching the video right now. If you're still watching, we'll ask, how do you uncover the internal structure of a word? Are there means for doing this? What are the tools you use to dissect a word on the anatomy table? Well, morphologists have many tools at their disposal. Some of them will be through the perusal of texts and comparison of forms and boring stuff like that. But one rather fun one is called expletive infixation. Um, we can demonstrate this on a word, a complex word like fantastic in English. How many morphemes has fantastic got? I'm not entirely sure. There's three syllables, one word, and that provides two boundaries between the first and the second syllable and between the second and the third. Maybe it's just a sequencing of three morphemes or three, or three syllables. Um, we're unsure at this stage. So expletive infixation is a means where we uh, probe the word by putting something like fucking in the middle. So we can compare fan fucking tastic with fantastic fucking stick. Now, if you're a native speaker of English, you will have noticed that the first one, while maybe not usable in polite company, is perfectly fine. And the second one is absolutely not a runner. So we've identified, using the tool of expletive infixation, a difference in the structure, internal structure, between that position between syllable one and two and the position between syllable two and three. Such are the wonders of morphology.